Welcome to China Forum, where leading experts discuss important topics regarding China and the U.S.-China relationship. Thank you for joining us as we continue our series, China Forum, Conversations with Ambassadors. Understanding our past diplomatic relationship with China and learning lessons from the ambassadors who helped shape it are vital for ensuring strong diplomacy and effective China policy in the future. Today, we have the pleasure of being joined by Ambassador Max Baucus. In 2014, President Obama nominated Max Baucus to be the U.S. Ambassador to the People's Republic of China. He served as ambassador for three years until 2017. Ambassador Baucus formerly served as the senior United States Senator from Montana from 1978 to 2014 and was Montana's longest serving U.S. Senator. While in Senate, Ambassador Baucus was chairman and ranking member of the powerful Senate Committee on Finance. In this position, Ambassador Baucus gained extensive experience in international trade, including leading the passage and enactment of free trade agreements with 11 countries. Before his election to U.S. Senate, Ambassador Baucus represented Montana in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1975 to 1978. Ambassador Baucus earned his bachelor's in law degree from Stanford University. Welcome, Ambassador Baucus. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Before you became the U.S. Ambassador to China, you served as U.S. Senator from Montana. What were some of your experiences with China in your role as Senator? Well, it's a very good question. Um, it just seems to me when I look back <clears throat> that China has been in my blood um, ever since I first started to serve in the U.S. Congress and in the Senate. And that's uh, for a couple of reasons. One, my uh, mentor, my political mentor, was uh, Mike Mansfield, who was an uh, ambassador to uh, Japan. And he was a Far East Asian history professor at the University of Montana, a revered man. Everybody who knew Mike Mansfield thought he was, just, he was just next to God. He, he was so smart. And he was so at, at such continence. He was so gracious and so wise. Anyway, um, um, I, I, he encouraged me to get involved in public service. Um, I worshipped him anyway, um, and, um, and I was um, in the Congress. Frankly, I spent quite a bit of time thinking about China issues, um, and I did a few things. One, I, whenever there was a new ambassador from China appointed to Washington D.C. I would um, ask that ambassador to come to my home state in Montana, to visit Montana, uh, to uh, poke around so that Montanans could learn a little bit about China and, and, and the Chinese ambassador could learn a little bit about the um, um, about the Montana and, and the United States. And uh, there's a long list of um, Zhang Yusui, uh, uh, the most recent ambassador from China, uh, Sui Cheng Kai was another, and uh, interestingly, uh, uh, Yang Jiechur. Um, I invited him to come to Montana when he was an ambassador. Now he's probably the leading policy maker on U.S.-China relationships in, 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 in China. But he came to Montana, and as did a couple others. So that was a lot of it. In addition, I would take Montana business groups and delegations uh, to China, um, in different parts of China, obviously Beijing, but in, in southern China, Yunnan province, uh, for example, is when it comes comes to mind. And um, unfortunately, these did not materialize in a lot of business arrangements, but it was exposed Montana to China. Um, it, was, it was part of the legacy of Mike Mansfield. Um, interestingly, Mike Mansfield wanted to be a, a, an ambassador to China. When he left the United States Senate in 1976, that was his first choice. But unfortunately, that position was already taken by Leonard Woodcock, so Mike uh, <laughs> took his second choice, which was Japan. But he's a, a, a he's a huge influence on me personally, and a significant influence in the state of Montana. So that's so I was quite involved. There's, a, there's also kind of a deeper, um, more subtle, but maybe as strong reason uh, that I'm interested in China and how I was all the time that I was at public service. Um, that's because when I was in college, I took a year off. And I hitchhiked around the world from 1960, August 62, oh, wow. yeah, from August 62 uh, to August 63. 
But more than that, uh, when I was in Africa, it just hit me as kind of an epiphany that the world's getting smaller, our natural resources are diminishing, and if we're going to do better as people, we need to work harder to work better together. It was just it was just an epiphany, it just hit me when I was in the middle of Africa on this trip. And so I've been involved, very interested in trying to work out arrangements, uh, agreements um, among and between countries, because we do have to work better together, in my judgment. Um, and um, clearly, China, as um, about to be the largest economy in the world, is a country that, that we have to work with. Your career in the Senate definitely reflected this emphasis on international relations and trade. Can you discuss the U.S.-China Relations Act of 2000 and China's 2001 entry into the World Trade Organization? Uh, yeah, that was that was <laughs> that was a um, very important, um, obviously, and, and important to me personally. Uh, during one trip when I was in China, I was very fortunate to meet uh, Zhu Rongji, Premier Zhu, as very very impressed with him. I thought to myself, holy mackerel, this guy's smart. He is an amazing man. And he was talking about the Chinese economy. I was, it was a small group. I was in the small group with him. And um, we started talking about WTO. And, and I just felt, A, as a general principle, that it made sense for China to be part of the, the World Trade Organization rather than outside of it, that more we're all working the same set of rules the same procedures that better off are going to be. And second, China is such a big country. It's just huge. It made sense for China to be a member. It was, it was, a, it was a slam dunk for me. It's, it was just obvious that that's what, that should be the case. So I pushed for that. And frankly, it was Premier Zhu who also said to me at the time, I remember once at the White House, I was with President Clinton, and Premier Zhu was there. I was walking out of the White House uh, talking to, to Premier Zhu. Jew and, and about WTO and PNTR. And he said to me, well, we really need this. And said, push me hard. Push me, Premier Jew, very, very hard. Because the more you push on me, the more I can push back in China. I can push back on some of the, the non-reformers in China, some of the people in China who are opposed to China's entrance to the WTO. Well, that made good sense to me. And I, <laughs> so I kind of ramped up my, my, my efforts to get WTO passed. And I pushed very hard uh, for a PNTR for China. Um, in fact, the word normal is really from is my, is from me. I, I'm the author of the word normal. <laughs> it's, it's a very small point, but with all the other, like, like Russia, PNTR. Um, but um, I, boy, I'll tell you, I have deep scars um, pushing for a PNTR for, uh, for China. It is, um, uh, uh, basically from the more liberal members of the Democratic Party, Remember back at that time, we were um, um, the United States Congress was granting annual conditional extensions of MFN uh, to, uh, to communist countries, um, and that was basically a relic of a statute called uh, called Jackson Fannick passed a few years earlier, uh, based on uh, Jewish immigration policies from communist countries. It wasn't it didn't have much to do with trade; it was Jewish immigration. But anyway. Um, um, that was the law, and um, until we passed, until China entered WTO, we passed uh, uh, most favored nation status permanently for China. Uh, up to that point, our, it was it was conditional, it was annual, and it caused a huge, huge problem because it was conditional and annual. Uh, that meant that members of Congress had all kinds of conditions that they put on as riders and amendments before they vote for an annual extension. A lot of them had to do with human rights. A lot of them had to do with um, a PLA, um, allegedly manufacturing products in competition with American companies. It just made no sense to me with all those conditions to be on. Rather, let's deal with those issues separately, not as a condition to a permanent uh, normal trading relations status with China. But um, anyway, we finally got a pass. I, got, I have deep memories of the scars from Democrats, more liberal members of the Democratic Party, it, 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 vitriolic uh, accusations and privately, mostly against me for well, selling out. But if I didn't make a difference to me, it was the right thing to do. It's the right thing for China to enter WTO and, and the United States to grant to the same tr uh, trading status to China as we do to other countries. And in fact, uh, this is not known very, very well in the United States. We say 
you know, PNCR. People think that, well, that favors China. No, 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 no. It favors U.S. companies. <laughs> that's the effect of it. Same with the PNCR for Russia. That's now been repealed. That's nuts. It's crazy. And don't forget, there are a lot of efforts since the, since 2000 to repeal um, PNCR for China, to go back to the annual conditional extension, and to and for China and for the United States to urge the withdrawal of China from WTO. Many efforts in the Congress. They didn't succeed, but there were many efforts. So it was, a, it was very contentious. But for me, it was, a, again, it was a, a no-brainer. Um, it it's very clear to me that if we're going to work, work really well with China and China of the world, it makes much more sense for China to be a part of WTO, part of the club, rather than outside. Because it was outside, believe me, I believe very strongly that the, the, the uh, training relationship we have with China would be much worse than it is even today, if China were not in WTO. What do you think some of the legacy of that move back in 2000, 2001 is still being seen today? Well, it's, it's bubbling. Um, it's, it's, um, I, I think that it's, it's, for some, it's a bit of a backdrop uh, for their efforts to be very critical of China. And in, in favor of putting tariffs, as President Trump did, on Chinese goods coming to the United States and being very restrictive on um, Chinese investments in the United States. Um, it's, it, it all comes down to a very simple fact, and that is that um, China is a rising power. The United States is established power. At, at some point, the Chinese economy is going to be larger than that of the United States, and that is a very, very hard pill for Americans to swallow. Most Americans who have exceedingly short attention spans anyway, and most people in most countries do, uh, just cannot conceive of a time when there's another country larger than the United States, another country whose economy is larger than that of the United States. And, um, and, and, that, and that, it is, that is the basis, that is rising power, basing uh, established power, it is the cause of, of consternation back then, and consternation today. It's, it is the defining question that's going to have to be resolved, hopefully resolved better than, than otherwise, but it is the question. And that's, that's a major legacy um, of WTO, PNTR. That is, they were just examples of, of the debate that is ongoing now with respect to um, the economic relationship between the United States and China. Let's move forward to when you were nominated to be the U.S. Ambassador to China by President Obama in 2014. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like? Well, first, um, I really decided to um, just not run again for the Senate. Um, it was the most difficult professional decision of my life because I served the Senate six terms, loved it. I was a super job chairman of the, the Finance Committee, by far the best committee in the Congress. But I'd done that before, and I wanted something new. Uh, so it was a very difficult professional decision for me to make not to, not to run again, um, but rather to have just jump into the ocean and sink or swim. So I decided not to run again. And then very soon thereafter, President Obama called me up and asked if I want to go to China. Man, oh, man, I grabbed at that in a nanosecond. <laughs> Absolutely. I really want to go to China. In fact, he, he telephoned me here in Montana. I'm calling out from Montana, and I was at a halftime at a football game about five miles from here when, they, when he made the telephone call to me. But I, 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 I really dug into the preparation. I, I talked to a lot of people. I talked to uh, Secretary Henry Kissinger, got his um, ideas about a thing or two, and I got his book on China and read that um, and, and just got boned up the best I possibly could. And I knew a little bit about China anyway, so that helped. And it's, it was, it was just, it was, it was a very rewarding time to work and, and work for that confirmation uh, hearing. Um, I might, I might say though that um, <laughs> the one person who asked the toughest questions was Senator McCain. Um, he was kind of skeptical of the U.S.-China relationship, and his questions are kind of tough. I, I don't remember the questions of any other, except um, after the confirmation hearing, <laughs> uh, Senator Rubio walked up to me. It, we chatted this and that, and um, he said he's going on a trip to to Asia. I go, oh, where are you going? 
and oh, I'm going to Japan and I'm going to South Korea and Philippines. Are you going to China? I asked. Oh, no, I'm not going to China. I'm scared of China. China frightens me. And I thought, well, come on. If, that's all the more reason you should be going to China. I did not engage him on that issue, but I was just surprised that his reaction is kind of afraid, frightened to, to go to China. Um, and then I think, frankly, it is, I, I should have put my psychoanalyzed Senator Rubio, but um, it's easy for him to be extremely critical of, um, of, of China, having not been there. Um, my view is if he were to spend much more time in China, uh, talk to people in China, I mean, he could still have his, his views about, about the relationship as a senator from Florida. But when you don't go to the other country, he never been there, and I must not spend time there. That's, that's kind of difficult for you to come up with an objective view. So anyway, I, my main point there is, it's just, that's an example of the, the dearth of, of personal relation, uh, communications and, between our two countries. And it's fallen off dramatically in the last uh, five, 10 years. There was more of it when I was there, I was serving. Um, but it's even tough then to get congressional delegations to come on over. Um, but boy, since President Trump was elected, personal travel back and forth has fallen dramatically. And of course, COVID makes it very difficult to visit China. Coming from 35 years serving in the Senate, how did these experiences shape your approach to the role as ambassador? Well, I um, uh, my main goal uh, in public service is to try to find solutions to legitimate problems. Uh, I'm not much of a cause guy. I'm not a person who stands up and rants and raves and tries to stir people up for a political purpose. Rather, I tend to be a little more low key and try to listen more to people, find out their points of view, and try to find a solution where both sides would come out ahead. That's really my main approach. That's the approach I took when I was in the US Senate. Um, it's the approach I took on trade agreements. I spent a good bit of time uh, talking to uh, uh, trade officials in, in other countries, uh, Mexico and Canada and Bahrain. Um, and some uh, Latin American countries come to mind most immediately. And um, it's, it's just, that was just, that's just my approach. And second is to work really hard, uh, to be very, very well prepared. Um, it's, it's an old axiom. People have said it many times, but, you know, success is about 99% perspiration, about 1% inspiration. I mean, it, most, of, most success comes down to just a lot of preparation, a lot of hard work. Uh, I'm no genius. But I, I, I work hard to try to, to listen and to try to find a solution because I just think that's, that's really a much better approach to take. And we're better off when we do that. And it comes back down to the experience I had when I was hitchhiking around the world. I mentioned the epiphany when I was in Africa. We got to get along together. We got to work together. <laughs> and for our, not just for ourselves, but more importantly, for our kids and our grandkids. The real question is, what kind of legacy are we going to leave, all of us in public service? Um, sure, we want to help our country in a, right now, but even more important, what about our kids and our grandkids? That's, that, that, I think, is even more important. What were some of the biggest adjustments you had to make making that switch over? When I arrived in Beijing? Yes. Uh, well, the, um, there were a lot of adjustments. One is... Um, I've never managed a big organization. And the U.S. mission in China is pretty large. There are about 2,300 employees, um, half are in Beijing and half are, are in the consulates around the country. And um, it was difficult. Add to that, uh, the U.S. mission in, in China consists not only of the State Department, but virtually every other federal agency in Washington, D.C., that is Department of Energy. Department of Interior, uh, EPA, CDC, you name it. So each of those agencies had offices in, in uh, the embassy in Beijing, and each of them had their separate mission. And one of my main jobs was to try to coordinate all that, so kind of one sort of a single purpose. So there's um, so a common theme among all the different efforts that we undertook. Um, and it was hard. Uh, but I worked very hard at it to try to get us working better together. A uh, second major adjustment um, is um, it was a little bit difficult for me 
uh, to, to sort of pierce, uh, if you will, the Chinese government veil. By that I mean, um, as an American, you know, I'm the kind of guy who likes to talk to people and, and assume that when you talk to somebody, they're going to be pretty straightforward and tell you what they think, et cetera. Um, and you can, you can learn a little bit about the other person. But in China, after I arrived and spent some time with the Chinese government, I began to realize it's, it's, it's very, very hard uh, to you have a candid conversation with anybody in government. Um, and it's, 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 it's the Communist Party. I understand it. Um, it's very tight. The card, they keep their cards close to their vest. And one of the most, one of the more disappointing times, one of the ambassadors that I invited, uh, Chinese ambassador uh, uh, to Washington, D.C., earlier, that I invited to Montana, I liked very, very much. I really liked him a lot. And um, back in Beijing, I had lunch with him. My wife and I had lunch with him and his wife. And I thought, oh, gee, this would be great. And he'll, he'll open up. Um, he'll can't tell me more what's really going on. Give me some clues. No, 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 not at all. He didn't open up. Once I started asking, you know, pretty pertinent questions about the Chinese government and the party, uh, that's not really public information. He was, he still was a very good friend, but he did not really open up at all. So that was a huge adjustment. Adjusting to a, a, a country that is not, uh, uh, or the government is not very transparent. I mean, if our ambassador to Japan or to South Korea, a European country, it'd all be very different. But as a U.S. ambassador to, to China learns pretty quickly that um, it's very hard to make uh, to learn what what, what actually is going on um, behind the, the government veil. So what was the U.S.-China relationship like when you arrived in 2014, and how did that compare to the relationship when you left in 2017? Uh, there, it was when, during the time I was serving, it was okay. I won't say it was great, but it was okay. It was a time when the United States um, policy was um, engagement when most decision makers, including the President Obama and the Obama administration, uh, felt that, gee, the more we engage China at all levels of um, you know, interparliamentary conferences and things called SNED and uh, cultural exchanges and, and CODELs and, and so on and so forth, the more uh, they're gonna be a little bit more like us. And that was, it was arrogant, it was condescending, but that was the policy. Uh, we Americans tend to think we're a little, we have a better idea how to run the world uh, than other people. And that, that's an, that's an arrogant view. We have a, we're only one country. Other countries have different points of view. China has a different point of view. I had to spend some time, frankly, convincing our staff, your embassy staff, hey, we're no better than China. Our people are no better than Chinese people. Um, when you speak, I would say that I sense a little condescension. I sense a little arrogance. We've got to stop that. We're equals. American people, the same as Chinese people. And so that, that was that was something that I had, I had to really work, work hard on uh, when I arrived over there. And it, but during the time I served, um, it's it a bit tenuous. It was during the South China Sea. Um, uh, I call it a debacle in the sense that other countries, Philippines, um, um, Indonesia, contested those islands in the South China Sea, just as did China, but China wouldn't pay attention to other countries' interests. It, it, um, it was right by might. That is, China's there, China could take those islands, China could dump sand on those, uh, on those reefs and build up those islands. And it was a tough time. We couldn't do anything about it, Americans, and we didn't do anything about it. Um, something else I, I learned back then, which was kind of disappointing, frankly, is that, in my judgment, the United States did not have a long-term strategic policy with respect to China. I'd be on a good number of meetings with the Nas U.S. National Security Council um, in, in real time, and the, the conversation was very ad hoc. It was very reactive uh, to what China was doing that day, the, the previous day. It wasn't part of a wasn't plugged into a longer term strategic plan um, for China. And we, we've not done that. We've done a little of that, but we haven't done very much of it. We don't have one today that I can put my finger on, at least not one that's thought through. It's still very reactive. And it's um that that was a that was a that was an adjustment. That was a disappointment. 
Um, and I would say that's something I learned when I was there. And I, 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 we've, we've got to change that. We've got to develop a longer term strategic plan with respect to China, or else we're going to be in deeper trouble than we already are. One of the milestones during your time as ambassador was the 2015 Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Uh, what was that process like, and what were some of the challenges? Well, that was really interesting. Um, I really threw myself into that one. Um, when I first talked to the Chinese leadership about the Paris Agreement and the climate, and maybe President Xi Jinping joined with President Obama, <laughs> it was like talking to a fence post. I got nowhere. I got not a glimmer of interest at all, at all. Um, and some of our um, cabinet secretaries would come over, I mean, and there were annual summits mm -hmm. between President Obama and uh, President Xi, and they'd raise a climate uh, with President Xi. And, and um, gradually over time, I could see uh, in the Chinese a little glimmer of interest. Maybe the Chinese thought, maybe there's something we should do about this. And I think there are several reasons. Um, one, um, it, it, um, it fit a little into, it's not exactly the same, it fit a little into the, the air pollution uh, that was, was so rampant at the time in, in many Chinese cities, especially in Beijing. And that's not directly related to climate, but it's a close cousin. And the more the Chinese government would spend more time on climate, the more they could also look like, and they'd probably spend more time dealing with air pollution um, in China. Um, but And second uh, reason I think there's a little glimmer of interest is because uh, President Xi saw, hey, this is a great opportunity. Uh, for me, President Xi Jinping, to be on the world stage with uh, with President Obama. President Obama can be leading the developed countries, and President Xi felt that he could be leading the developing countries with a joint uh, agreement on climate. Then there are other reasons, too, that I think that China, uh, that China became more interested in joining the Paris Accord. Um, and one is, um, it, um, it just as was the case with WTO, that is, just as Zhu and Xi said to me, hey, push me, push me hard because, so I can push back on the non-reformers um, in my country. The same was true in China. I mean, China, a lot of Chinese leadership, including, uh, I'm quite certain, although he did not say this to me, President uh, uh, Xi wanted us to push him because then he could uh, push back on the non-reformers in, in the Chinese government, telling them, hey, they're pushing me, those, those Americans, we got to do something about this. Then I think there's still another reason. Uh, why China became interested. And they, this is a major reason, I think. It, they saw, hey, this is a huge opportunity where we can start to develop our own renewable energy uh, resources and products, like solar power, solar panels, you know, wind power. And boy, China did with a vengeance and consequently flooded the United States with, with, with wind power products, with solar power products. China still makes the largest percentage by far of the world's solar panels. But they saw that as an opportunity as they embraced climate change with, with the United States and entered the Paris Accord. Under the Trump administration, the U.S. withdrew from the Paris Agreement. Although President Biden did rejoin the Paris Agreement shortly after assuming office, what do you feel the impact of the U.S. temporarily leaving the Paris Agreement was? I think um, uh, President Trump's Pulling out of the Paris Accord was disastrous. It's disastrous for the world. Um, and I, it's certainly for the United States. And, and I also think for a, it encouraged China, maybe not work as hard to meet some of the goals it prescribed them earlier. In fact, uh, carbon emissions in, in China started to come down a little bit um, in the, the year or two uh, before I left. And I think in 2016, 17, to, total number of carbon emissions in China came down. But then they've come up quite significantly afterwards. Um, and I, I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One is, 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 is President Trump's decision to, to pull the United States out of the, the Paris Accord. And that encouraged other countries to, hey, hey the United States isn't going to belly up and tackle climate. Why should we? I'm quite certain that has a, a significant psychological effect on, on the reason why Chinese carbon emissions have gone up significantly. Now, of course, there's another reason too, and that's COVID. And uh, uh, the, actually, the Chinese economy shut down a little bit during COVID, but 
now that COVID is being, really, uh, being relaxed, um, production and emissions, uh, carbon emissions in China have gone up again. And so it's a combination of Trump, I think, and, 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 and uh, post-COVID, although Shanghai's got big COVID problems now, but post-COVID that, uh, that caused increase in emissions. So uh, Trump pulling out is a major problem. There's no question about it. What are some other key challenges or achievements from your time as ambassador? I um, <laughs> it wasn't a challenge, but I, I went all around the country and I presented my credentials to President Xi. I told him I'm going to visit every single province in China. He looked at me and he said, well, that's great. And every time I saw him um, since that day, he, he, he asked me, I mean, he had a book on me. He knew how many provinces I'd been to at, at that point, maybe a year or two later. He really appreciated my getting around, visiting all the provinces, and I, I, I loved it. I, it's, it's China is such a huge country. You go north and uh, Heilongjiang, down to south and Yunnan or Hainan, and you go far west to Xinjiang or the, the coast. Um, it's just the eastern coast. It's just it's just mad, amazing country. So that was not a challenge. That was a joy. The the biggest challenge, frankly, was getting. Um, really good access to the Chinese government. Um, and I, the reason is obvious because that's the system is very opaque. I mean, they don't, it's not very transparent. It's very hard to get access in, in, in China. I, um, but I took, I, I took us, I still dealt with that the best way I could. And I, whenever I go to a, a province I schedule a meeting with, a, with, a, with the provincial, um, or the, or the Party secretary, or or the governor of the province, or a big city, the party secretary, like say in Shanghai, and I'd make my points, um, and the uh, it's and there was not much of a reaction. They reacted a little bit, but basically the reaction was kind of was platitudes, it was kind of the usual back and forth stuff. Uh, but still, I made all my points. I'd go all around the country making the same points, knowing that in each meeting, um, my points were being recorded. And they're, they're just they're the governments get the same message over and over and over again. Um, so opacity was a challenge. There's another challenge which I had a lot of fun dealing with, and that is never have a meeting, uh, when I first arrived, that is, uh, with a major government official. Um, we'd be sitting across the table. He'd have his talkers, which he'd read, and interpret, and interpret. Everybody, everybody on his side of the table had the same talkers. Well, my crack staff gave me my talkers on my side of the table. And um, I started to read my, my talkers. Well, then I realized, hey, this is nuts. I mean, it's so it's too formalistic. He's reading the government view. I'm reading the U.S. government view. At least we're reading each other's views. But why don't we have a more candid conversation? So I learned right off the top just to be rude by American standards, that is. That is, interrupt um, that official mid sentence and ask a constructive question. Um, like, gee, that's very interesting. Could you explain that more fully? Or, um, I did not quite understand that last point you made. Could you explain it again? And they get off their talkers. And, um, and, and I also realized off that I had the more candid I was in a constructive way, but candid, the more that, that, that was effective. So an earlier challenge was, um, all the form, dealing with all the formality, and the way I dealt with it is again uh, urge uh, the, the person I was talking with to get rid of his talkers and to be much more candid myself. Now they would be as candid as I'd like, but every it, it, it a chip away, it all helped. I also, frankly, had to train um, uh, U.S. Uh, CEOs. They came over, not those would be not CEOs of big companies who've been in China a long, long time. But rather CEOs who were kind of new to China. I had to train them to be direct, ask questions. Don't just sit back and be nice and listen. Ask questions. Um, that's why you're here. And the better the questions, the better. Ask constructive questions, not personal, negative, but constructive, honest questions. And I had to train even cabinet secretaries to do the same thing, uh, to be, make best use of the time. Once a, the sort of the cream of the crop, the U.S. military came over, these are all one-star level, and we met 20 or 30. I met with them before they met with the Chinese military. And I said to them, don't be too um, rigid. Don't 
don't adhere too much to your military background by being too respectful of your, of your military superior. Ask questions. Ask a lot of questions. Um, and questions that are on the top of your mind, but you're kind of afraid to ask, ask them. And so anyway, they did. And about a, a day later, I was at a big reception. I walked up to the host. I asked him, the Chinese host, I said, were, were my people too hard on you? Oh, no, he said. They were terrific questions. They were really good. And so that's a real lesson learned for anybody, um, any American in China. Ask really constructive questions and be very candid. I think Chinese are more candid uh, than Americans. Uh, Chinese respect candor more than do Americans. They love it. And, um, and there are a lot of reasons, I think, to explain that. It's a, but I think it's very important for Americans to be candid. That's a lesson learned because it, make, it's, it makes it's better use of one's time. Definitely. Given your experiences both in the Senate and as ambassador, what advice do you have for those currently working on U.S.-China relations? Um, listen. Uh, listen. Now, sometimes you're just going to get the party line. But you got to... <clears throat> It's the whole thing. You're going to listen to the music as well as the words, kind of read between the lines, uh, be very, very attentive, very empathetic to what's really going on. That's number one. Number two, be very candid, um, constructively, not personally, constructively. Uh, ask good questions, constructive, um, candid questions, because they, they, they like that. Um, um, remember that you're, as an American, you're no better than, than they are. I mean, we're just people. One of my favorite moments um, occurred when um, I was um, oh, with one of those conferences. I think it was an SNED between the United States and China. I think Secretary Pritzker was leading it, and um, she's making her points at this conf at this meeting. There are about two hundred people there, and I was with uh, Secretary Pritzker. I had about two or three down on the table. She gave her talkers. Everybody on our side gave our talkers. They gave their talkers. Well, it came down to me, and I just, I was tired of this. I mean, this is just it is, it is embarrassing, frankly, uh, to be reading the same points over and over again. It, I had more self respect than to just do that. So, what did I do? When it came to me, I just threw my talkers aside. I just started speaking you know, impromptu, extemporaneously. And here's what I said, because it just dawned on me about that point. As I look around this room, I realize I am the only person in this room who's ever run for elective office. Nobody else in this room has ever, ever run for elective office. And I can tell you, I've run many times. I've run 18 times, if you include primary elections and general elections. And I've learned a lot when you're running for office. Um, and what is it I've learned? Well, one I've learned is that um, we're, we're all alike as people. What do people really care about? What they really care about is is a decent income, food on the table, um, you know, take care of their kids, decent education for their kids, decent health care, air and water pollution addressed, you know, maybe a little able to pursue their dreams a little bit, not be put upon too much. It's everybody's the same, whether in America or in China. We're all the same. I've learned that. Um, running for office, just listening to people and working with people. Everybody has the same hopes and desires worldwide. They're about the same. That's number one. Number two, what have I learned? I've learned that people are pretty smart. After a while, they kind of get it. They kind of know what's going on, even, even, despite what maybe public officials say. It's still about what Abraham Lincoln said, you can fool all the people some of the time or some of you can't fool them all. It's, it's sort of the same point. When I, so I said, while we're here working on these, this S and E D, we're here trying to work out subpart B of section C and all that kind of thing. It's a little dry and so forth. Just remember why we're here. We're here to represent our people and, and, and what people really care about. They care about really what I, ju I just said, both in China and the US. Man, oh man, looked across the table, huge big grins on the Chinese side. Then the Chinese broke into spontaneous applause. I asked myself, what's going on here? What's this? I looked on my side of the table. There isn't know what was going on. And I think what really happened then was I was speaking. I was not asking the Chinese to do something. I was not demandeur. I was not condescending. I was not arrogant. I was just a person talking to a person. And that's, that doesn't happen very often when American officials talk to the Chinese. Now, they really appreciated it a lot. 
And I think that's why they broke into spontaneous applause. In fact, um, well, a famous, a well-known Chinese, Leo Hu was there. And his assistant walked up to me afterwards and said, my boss told me that's the best speech he's heard in a long time. It's just because we were speaking person to person. And that really is a lesson for all of us, whether it's an American ambassador in China um, or what's the American ambassador in any other country or just in, just in life. It is, remember, people really have the same hopes, desires. And that's decent income and food on the table for the kids. That's, and just and work helped, so, worked so that we all get that. Along those lines, what are your hopes for the U.S.-China relationship moving forward? I'm very concerned. I'm, I'm, I'm troubled. I think we're uh, at a tipping point. The relationship has gone downhill quite precipitously the last several years, and it's getting worse. I thought maybe that you know, we hit bottom after the Trump four years and Biden took over, but it, it's, it's still going south. Um, the United States is imposing more sanctions on China. It's um, with it's Hong Kong or Xinjiang or under, under the aegis of national security or whatnot. It's going south. It's still going south. And uh, in the Chinese side, you, 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 Chinese nationalism is rising. Um, President Xi is, um, uh, and some Chinese officials are pretty critical of the United States. The first real interaction between U.S. and China that signaled that things were not going to go too well was an anchorage between the uh, Chinese uh, State Council, Yang Duchu, and, um, and State Department Secretary Tony Blinken. Now, it's, we're at a tipping point here. And um, China and President Xi looking for a third term. There's more oppression now in China than before. Um, it just feels more tight than before. Social credit system, COVID lockdowns, and it's China pushing its economic might worldwide, whether it's Belt and Road Initiative or um, in South America or in Africa, um, wherever it is. It's, it's and on the China, and American side, it's putting together a group of alliances, whether with European countries, including Australia and South Korea and Japan. It just seems like we're moving more and more toward, toward a kind of a Cold War. And it's not a nuclear Cold War, but it's a technological Cold War. It's a cultural Cold War. And um, we're just isolating each other. There can be two separate big camps. I'm very, very worried. Um, that's the direction in which we're going. And it's, I just very much hope that the President Xi, and I hope that uh, President Biden or the next president, or succeeds President Biden, starts to realize, hey, much better to work with each other uh, than not. Uh, this this current trend is very, very troublesome to me, and it's going to take a lot of work to, to turn that around. Before we conclude our conversation, is there anything else you'd like to add? No. Um, hope springs eternal. All of us in public service essentially are optimists. And uh, as dire a situation might seem at the time, um, it'll get better if we keep trying uh, to make it better. Um, if we don't keep trying to make it better, it's not going to get better. So that, it's really a, a call and a reminder of the value of optimism and working hard to make things better. Definitely. That's all the time we have for today. Ambassador okay. Bacchus, thank you so much for sharing your memories and insights with us. To everyone watching, Thank you for joining us and a special thank you to our sponsors. We look forward to seeing you next time on China Forum.